الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته How is everyone today? Are you guys okay? Can you guys stand up for me for a second please? Quickly, 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 quickly. You guys ever done any martial arts training or anything like that? Okay, well, when you get tired, you need to warm up a bit. Sisters, don't worry, we're not going to look at you. But you need to make sure you do it anyway. The, and if you don't do it, I'm going to make you come to the front and do push-ups. If you don't believe me, you can ask Sheikh Yusuf, I did it last time. Even though it got me in trouble, but I'll do it again. Because I, I take great pleasure in humiliating everyone. Okay? Just jump on the balls of your feet like you're boxing. Like you're just boxing. Are you ready to just kick someone in the face? Go and do it. I said jump! Jump! Okay, sit, sit, sit. Alhamdulillah. Now, can I just ask maybe two or three sisters from the back to call everyone who's out there into the, into the auditorium kind of thinking me, Jake? Because I have something very important I want to share. And is there, if there is anyone outside this place, I want them inside. Because inshallah today, I promise you, I promise you, if you listen from your heart, not your ears, your life will change today. I promise you that. I promise you, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Look, the, talk, the topic that I'm going to be discussing with you people today, inshallah, is about happiness. The title of this talk is Happiness Is. What is happiness? We define happiness by many things. But before I go into talking to you about the crux of what I want to explain to you today, what I want each and every single one of us to understand is the fact that anything we do in life, anything, the objective is always to acquire happiness. Or, or to move away from unhappiness. Is there anything that you do that doesn't fit into one of these two categories? Is there anything? If you go and study, either it is to acquire the happiness of a good job or it is to run away from the unhappiness of your dad pulling out a belt and slapping it around your face. Am I wrong? There is always an element of happiness that you're either trying to acquire or an unhappiness that you're trying to move away from. For that reason, happiness is very important. Right? Which is why I commend Sheikh Yusuf for coming up here and talking to you guys about the fact that this dunya is making people who have already acquired this dunya extremely unhappy. And we think that the dunya will make us happy, right? I want to talk to you from my own personal story of what I thought happiness was and how I found true happiness. To the extent where, wallahi, I challenge each and every single one of you. Wallahi, I swear by Allah, Allah di qasam, I challenge you. I genuinely feel as if I am the happiest man on this earth right now. I'm, honestly, I'm yet to come across someone who is happier than me. That I can say this person's happier than me. I don't know, maybe it's there. Maybe she's there. Maybe one of you guys. But I'll challenge you to it. And I'm going to tell you how I acquired this happiness. So you can walk out of this room, inshallah, with the formula. I don't promise I will leave you happy. I can't do that. When we said, Ya Muqallib, we talk to Allah, He's the one who changes the hearts. Right? What I can do is give you the formula. It's up to you if you want to live a depressed life and die in your own nappy, in a toilet seat, like many people have, addicted to drugs, alcohol all around you, or you want to die with a smile on your face, eager to meet your master. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to explain to you a bit about where I'm coming from, but it would be very nice if I could get a portable mic. Because, I, you know, I, I'm, I feel restricted here. I want to move around, jump around and do backflips and roly polies all over the stage. And they're trying to make me stand here like a posh old Sheikh Yusuf. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Or like a Mancurian Johnny. I'm going to get you, by the way, don't worry. So look, my name is Imran. I came from a background in the UK that is not very good. Are you guys familiar with the term street kid? So if I say to you that I'm a street kid, do you guys know what that means? Or I used to be a street kid, you know? It's like what you would say in Urdu is a badmash, a gangster, someone who rolls in their ends. If you look at me funny, you might get punched in the face. 
That's the kind of environment that I grew up in, unfortunately. I went to the 13th worst school in the country. Now you have to understand that when you're living in an environment like this, one of the things that comes with the package is poverty. People don't have money. They don't have food to eat. They don't get big posh university degrees. They're victims to prejudice and racism, right? These people, they don't have a way out like you guys do, mashallah. But they still have to feed their families. They still have to put food in the plate. So they resort to things like fraud, drug dealing, pimping. You guys know what pimping is? It's a filthy job. But they have to do these kind of things in order to just feed their family, just to pay the rent. So their mom doesn't have to go and sell herself in the streets. They have to sell a bit of cocaine, a bit of weed, a bit of marijuana. That's the background that I came from. Now Alhamdulillah, Allah protected me from many sins. But I was still tested. One of the ways that I thought I could make a living, one of the ways that I thought I could do something with my life was to become a rapper. You guys know what rap music is? You guys know rap music? What's rap music? I don't believe you. You ain't from the hood. You ain't from the hood. You lot fake. I used to come to Pakistan when I was nine. Eight years old, I used to see Tupac is alive, graffiti all over the wall. I was like, you guys don't even know who Tupac is. Masha, you guys have it nice here. What's rapping? Put your hand up, what's rap music? Ah, no one's confident enough to. <laughs> Look, rap music is a culture <coughs> that came as a result of gang violence. It came as a result of gang violence. For example, they know that if I have a, if I have a problem Look, rap music, right? It's a culture that came from gang violence. Say my gang is going to go up against Johnny's gang, and Johnny's gang obviously is going to get ruined, violated, and left for dead, buried six feet under the ground. This is how, how we roll, right? Manchester. That's how we roll. So, in order to stop the casualties, in order to prevent the death and the massacres and the murders, the, in, the, the rap music was something that just organically grew. So instead of me taking out my gun and shooting him, or me taking out my knife and stabbing him, I would come and I would rap with him. And we would have a battle. We would rap. Like in the time of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when before they used to go for war, they would bring the poets from their tribes, and the poets would compete. It was very much a similar culture like that. So you can imagine, I'm rapping about some crazy things, some violent things. Like, if you look at me funny, I take the Glock out, I make your blood run in. Astaghfirullah, that kind of jail, pathetic stuff. But you know what? I became very good. And I started to get known. And people would know my face. We call this fame. There are many rappers that you guys may have heard of, may have not heard of, that are very famous in the industry. And I've made songs with them, and I know them, and I facilitated some of their music careers. And I'm on some of their songs right now, but you'll never recognize my voice and you'll never recognize the name. It was a totally different name. So don't ask me because I'll never tell you. The only person who knows is Musa because this guy's snaky. He went undercover and started looking through my files and researched me. <laughs> Did like an FBI, CIA, ISI profiling of me and he uncovered everything of my past. But I'm trying to make you understand that I was on my way to becoming the first official Pakistani rapper to making real money and I made money I was 16, 17 years old and I used to make so much money that I did not know what to do with it you name it, you name the brands, the clothes Wallahi, I had them all. Wallahi, I had them all. The, you, there was not a brand that I wanted that I didn't have. There was not a jacket that I wanted that I didn't have. Or a pair of trainers. There was not a holiday that I wanted to go on that I didn't go on. I was able to spend my money however I wanted. To the extent where I made so much, I didn't know what to do with it. So I would go to my friends and I would say, what can I buy you? Xbox 360, come, let me take you to the shop. I'll buy you an Xbox. You guys know what Xbox is, yeah? Some people are like, no. You are not 
living in the 21st century, my friend. Yeah, you need to fast forward. <laughs> We're in the year 2014. <laughs> but I would buy them Xboxes and I would take them shopping and buy them. I would take them on holiday with me and buy them a PlayStation 3 from Dubai while we're there. This is the reality. So money I had, no problem. And I'm young, remember, I don't pay any rent. I don't pay any bills. I don't have to even buy my own food, my parents do that. I'm just, as we say, balling. Just doing, as you say in Pakistan, ash, ashi, ash karna. <laughs> and that's the life I'm living, right? But look, what else comes with this life? Usually people want money, but they want something else as well. What else do they want? Money and? Huh? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> but with money, happiness is the goal, right? But money is one of the ways you try to achieve happiness. But with money comes what? Power. Yeah, the fame was already there. Power. And power is important because power, not all the time, but it can bring you respect. And let me tell you about the kind of power I had. Little did I know I had no power. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. But to my delusion, whilst I was from the ghafilun, those who were deluded and in heedlessness, I believed I was an extremely powerful teenager. I could go to pretty much any part of the country and if someone had an issue with me, I would make one phone call and there will be a gang of people from wherever I summon them that would be ready to violate people, to hurt people, just because I called them. Literally, to the extent where people would see me, they would know, don't mess with this guy. We don't even want to look at his shoes. They wouldn't even look at your shoes if they know you are a bad man. They would not look at your shoes. My shoes cost a lot of money, you might give another. So I had money, I had power and respect. Now, I feel really embarrassed to admit the third thing to you. But you might be like, well, we don't need to hear it. But it's necessary for you to understand where I'm coming from. And wallahi, being in the presence of so many queens, I feel extremely shy and embarrassed to admit this fact. But as a guy in Jahiliya, when you have the money, the power, respect, the next thing that you want is a woman. Usually people want women. They want women. I didn't want women. I just wanted one. But I went through many. Alhamdulillah, Allah protected me from zina. Allah protected me. I never did zina. But that's a different story. But that didn't mean I didn't have girlfriends. And I could have had any girl that I wanted. We used to sit there and be like, what flavor do I want? Brazilian flavor? Do I want oriental flavor from China? Do I want Arabian flavor, Moroccan, Libyan, from the Gulf? Astaghfirullah, this was our mentality. I found a girl that I thought she would be my wife one day. I had a relationship with her for two years, up until I was 20 years old. And she was extremely beautiful. So beautiful that my closest friends would try and go behind my back just to speak to her. I would walk into a place and people were like, oh my days, Imran, you are a boss. A boss. That's the kind of girl that I have. Now look, think with me. Think with me. Run with me. Follow my logic. I have money, power, and I have the woman of my dreams. And I'm doing this because I want to be I want to be happy. You'd think I was happy, right? Be, look, don't try and act all righteous and pious with me, right? You'd think I was happy, right? Yeah. If I told you, here you go, right? Here's a beautiful looking girl, and here's a million pound, and bodyguards that if anyone touches you, they'll put them down. Are you going to be happy? Don't lie to me, man. Yeah, yeah. You'd be happy. If I told you I was going to give you a guy that looks like... To be honest, man, you guys have some really weird taste. The kind of guys women like in Pakistan. Quite... You know, Muslim men are very handsome, mashallah, tabarakallah. And you guys pick some ugly guys. Ritik Roshan, really. 
The guy has an extra thumb. The guy's a mutant. He should be in the X-Men. And you guys want to marry Ritik Roshan? Apart from the fact that he's a born shirk. <laughs> so, but let's pretend we give you a handsome boy like Musa Adnan. And we give you money so you can buy whatever handbag that you want. Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Prada, Christian Dior. Do you guys even know these names? Okay, yeah, they're like, yes. What do you mean? I'm a woman. Jimmy Choose, you guys know Jimmy Choose? So I got you there. But say I give you money but you can get all these things. And you are the envy of every other girl. Every other girl is like, I want to be like her. You'd think that would make you happy. Let's be real. I don't care if you pray five times a day. You would think that would make you happy. Listen to me. Listen to the words that are going to come out of my mouth right now. Wallahi, I had. I had that. And I stand before you telling you that none of it made me happy. Nothing. You don't understand what that feels like. That you work so hard just so you can have a smile on your face. Just so you can wake up in the morning and enjoy the day. And when you get everything you possibly can that you think will make you happy and it doesn't, do you understand how that messes you up? Because you think to yourself, I'm 20 years old and I've got all of this. Then what else can I possibly have? You name to me. You name it to me. What else could I possibly have that would add to what I already had? I had it all. It, would, it doesn't make sense. You can give me more money. But the money I already have is not making me happy me. You can give me better women. But the best of women that I already have are not making me happy. You can give me better friends. You can have people coming up to me like, yo, yo, sorry, bro. Let me clean your shoes. You can have more people like that. But it's already not making me happy. So there's something wrong. So in my head, as far as I'm concerned, life is going to be very, very sad. The rest of my life is going to be, excuse me, but it's going to be crap. It's going to be depressing. And every moment from here onwards is going to be heartbreak. Do you know what happens at this point to celebrities? Do you know what happens at this point? They start off nice, good. You guys know Justin Bieber? You guys know Justin Bieber? The cute boy. Baby, baby. It's not for like, it's from Jahiri, I know. <laughs> Justin Bieber, right? The cute little boy. He's singing and everyone's like, oh, Justin Bieber. They loved him so much that one time he smoked weed. You know weed, cannabis? That the girls all around the world, they were so upset that he smoked weed that they, they literally they cut their wrists. They took pictures and they tweeted it to him saying, please, Justin, stop. I find that pathetic. <laughs> but that's how much they loved him. Do you guys know what Justin Bieber is doing right now? Drinking, smoking, <laughs> sniffing. Why? These celebrities, cute, beautiful celebrities. Suddenly, you see all of them, they go down one direction. Drugs and alcohol, drugs and alcohol, antidepressant tablets, drugs and alcohol, antidepressant tablets, drugs and alcohol, antidepressant tablets. Do you know why they do that? Because they get to that stage that I was at, where you don't know what else will make you happy, and you admit the fact, and you, and you embrace the fact that life is rubbish, and material things don't bring you happiness. So you drink alcohol when you take drugs, because they help you not, they help you to not live the life that you're living. They help you smile. Drugs help you smile. Alcohol makes you forget about the pain. It makes you forget about the difficult life. It makes you forget about the fact that you used to dream of this life and when you had it, it turned out to be a piece of C-R-A-P explanation mark. Elvis Presley. You guys know Elvis Presley? 
You guys know Elvis Presley? Then answer me, innit? Yes. Elvis Presley was one of the most famous men in the world. He was beloved by the people. He had so much money. He would come on stage every night. He would perform in front of 10,000 people screaming his name. They loved him. And each one of those 10,000 people <coughs> would have paid $100 just to come and see him live. Just to come and see him live. You know what he would do every night when he'd go home? He would take the drugs ready, he would inject them into his arm. He would use that to soothe himself. He would do that three times in a night. I used to mess him up so much that he couldn't even use the toilet properly. He had to be taken to use the toilet. Close to his death, he had to wear nappies. And he died in his own toilet wearing a nappy, not even being able to go to the toilet. Someone asked his brother, why on earth did Elvis Presley need to take drugs? He was loved by the people. He had everything that anyone would want in life. Why on earth did this man die like that? You know what his brother said? He said, because not being sober was too painful for him. It was too painful for him. That life, too painful. He had to run away from it. As Brother Johnny indicated, we were with Brother Shoaib Akhtar a few days ago, a new friend of ours, the Rawalpindi Express. And you guys know his life. Playboy. He was a playboy, right? He used to go wherever he wanted in the world, live the life that he wanted to live. He said, 25 years I was depressed. I had to retire from cricket two and a half years ago because if I didn't, I would have ruined my life. So when I left the industry, when I left cricket, he said, I could have gone to Bollywood. I wanted to make money, he said, I could have gone to Bollywood. But if I went to Bollywood and carried on living that life, I would have killed myself within 10 years. When he said this to me, I started crying. Because here is a man in front of me telling me that if I lived that life, I would have killed myself. And that's the final thing that happens. After the drugs and the alcohol, because you realize that even that doesn't make you happy. When you realize that even the drugs and the alcohol can't make you happy, the only thing left to do to stop the sadness is to stop the heartbeat. So you kill yourself. So you kill yourself. What kind of a life is that? What kind of a life is that, man? And you guys look over to the West. Don't lie to me and tell me you don't. Look, let's not be around the bush. Who watches Pakistani Idol? Don't put your hand up. You watch Pakistani Idol, I know you do. I don't know. <laughs> I'm speaking generally. <laughs> you guys watch Pakistani Idol, you, you pray. But you watch that rubbish. That came from the UK. These dramas like Ishki Mamnoon and this filth where the plot line is incest. These ideals. I mean, Turkey took this from liberal values that they extracted from European culture. And you guys, Bollywood. Bollywood is a direct inspiration from Hollywood. And those guys are mushrikun anyway. They worship an elephant. They worship a monkey. And you follow their footsteps. You know what they do back home with this lifestyle? They kill themselves. Suicide in England has been on the rise for the last 20 years. For the last 20 years, suicide has been on the rise. But in England, you have everything. You have food. You have a house. You have, you know, you, 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 you don't get, you don't have to worry about drinking water and you're going to get hepatitis. You don't have to worry about these things. Everything's calm. Everything's hunky-dory. Why the hell are you killing yourself then? 
consistently. Norway is the richest country within Europe. And it has the highest suicide rate. It also has the highest atheist rate. It's connection. You don't have a lie in your life, what happens? What happens? When you don't have a lie in your life, there's no happiness. I'm going to come to that. I need you to understand this, brothers and sisters. I need you to fully understand this. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created you, He wanted you to be happy. So when He made your heart, He left an emptiness inside your heart. And this emptiness yearns for happiness. But a specific kind. Do you ever get that feeling that, okay, when I get this grade, I'm going to be happy. When I buy this outfit, I'm going to be happy. But you're not. You can get an A grade and graduate top of the class. But a week down the line, that happiness is not going to last. That grade is not going to keep you happy. You can get married and find an amazing husband. But the moment he upsets you, he broke your heart. The moment he chooses his friends or goes to play cricket instead of spending time with you, your husband is the source of your unhappiness. And that hole in your heart feels pain because it always wants to be happy. And it always wants to be taken care of. But the dunya can't fill it. And the dunya can't take care of it. Only Allah can. So let's pause and come back to my story. Now I had all these things. I had to run away from them. I shut down my recording studio and I left the music. I left it. I wasn't going to wait around and see if I was going to end up taking drugs. I wasn't going to wait around to see if I was going to end up killing myself. I knew it wasn't going to bring me happiness. I didn't know what will bring me happiness, but I knew this wouldn't, so I left it. I left my girlfriend and I left my friends. For eight months, I was a lonely person. I had nothing. I was broke. I had no friends. I had no love. I was alone. I happened to be at university studying law. I hated law. It made me even more sad. I would rather bleed pus from my eyes than pursue a career in the legal profession. Can you? I'm like, what am I going to do in my life? Even what I'm studying is killing me inside. So as I'm walking around university, Allah puts in my heart to go to the masjid in the, in the university. I didn't even know how to pray properly. But Allah puts in my heart, Ya Imran, go to the masjid. So I go to the masjid. And I'm sitting there, looking depressed. This one brother, he comes up to me. And he says, Salaamu Alaikum Akhi, Wa Alaikum Salaam. He asks me, why do I look so sad? So I tell him my story. And at the end of the story, you know what he says to me? He says, so let me get this straight. You put your happiness in the music. I said, yes. He said, you put your happiness in the friends. I said, yes. He said, you put your happiness in the girl. I said, yes. He said, then I have some news for you. If you put your happiness in these things, he said, Wallahi, you're going to live a very, very, very sad life. He said, you know why? Because when these things go, what's going to happen to your happiness? Your happiness will go. And wallahi, these things will go. Because nothing in the world is forever. So your happiness, rather your unhappiness, your sadness, your depression, your wretched and rubbish life is a guarantee. And that's the same for each and every single one of us right here. If your happiness is in anything that is a part of this world, your degree, one day you will retire. You might get sat. 
Who's gonna make you happy then? Your husband? What if you get divorced? What if he doesn't make you as happy as you thought? The money? What if it gets taken away from you? Something that you love will take, get taken away from you. And with it, your happiness will go. When he said that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. But then he smiled. He smiled and he said, but. He said, there is a way to be happy forever. He said, there is a way where you can be happy for the rest of your life. He said, put your happiness in the one that will never leave. And as a result, your happiness will never leave. I said, who? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, since that day, I have made it a personal mission to fall in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A personal mission. And I believe I'm on that journey. Which is why I stand before you as the happiest man in the world. Because Allah already gave me anything and everything I could desire. So there is not a single human being in the world. There is not a single human being in the world that can give me something I don't already have. Nor is there a single human being in the world that can take something away from me that I love. Does that make sense to you? Before I conclude, I want to touch upon one more point. It's very important that you understand this. See, those who are in the West, those who are in the West, you know what they do? They delude you. You think they're the bosses. Because they have the money, the fame, and the power, the glory. You think that these people, they got things right. That the way they live life must be the way we should live life. Their morals should be the morals that we should adopt. Because they're civilized and we're not. And as far as we're concerned, Islam is backward. And has nothing to offer the 21st century. How far from the truth could you be? My beloved brothers and sisters, how far from the truth could you be? For everything that the West has today, it took from Islam. When you look at the West, to take from them, they look towards you and they based everything that they have upon what you taught them. You don't believe me? Let me give you a few examples. And because we're in the presence of so many women, mashallah, I'm going to give you examples that relate to you. This is a university, correct? Right. It's a university establishment. Do you guys know where universities came from? And bear in mind that university is one of the, is, is, is one of the foundational things that, 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 that hold social, liberal, secular society together in the modern day progressive era. Universities are where everything happens. Science and technology develops. Academics come out. People are made. Politicians are made that change and shape the world that you follow today. It happens in these institutions. Agreed. Do you know where the university came from? Does any one of you know? Just raise your hand. My sisters, listen very closely. University. The first university was invented by a Muslim woman. Her name was Fatima Al-Fikri, rahimahullah from Morocco, a young teenage girl who was studying the religion of Islam but had a desire to become an alima, a woman of knowledge in this religion and also in the general sciences. So she established the first ever university. Who says that Islam oppresses women? Who says that Islam doesn't want women to study? Wallahi, the university is a legacy of you Muslim women. 
appreciate this reality. So you should be proud. Forget going to their countries to study. What on earth are you doing? I'm going to go and study in the USA. Harvard, Oxford. As we say in the streets, bond that fam. You should be creating these establishments here, reviving the honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you. But He gave you this honor when you had this book close to your heart. But when you left this book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took that honor away from you. You want me to give you the evidence? What do you guys wear when you graduate? You have the graduation robes and you have the hats. Does this look familiar? What does this look like? I'm asking you a question. What does this look like? Huh? Graduation hat. Do you know what the scholars would do? When the children, when the youngsters, when the teenagers, when the students would graduate, they would say, MashaAllah, Allahumma barak, tabarak Allah. Today you are a learned and educated man. You are graduating from this establishment. You have the ijaza to go out there and work and teach. However, bear in mind that this book is above your head. The kalam of Allah is the real knowledge. And this knowledge always is on top of you. Humble yourself, my students, for this is above your head and never forget that and wallahi for as long as they remembered that for 800 years we ruled the world in every single field politically socially academically you name it you name it the robes that you wear when you graduate have you not seen what the shaykh wear the imam in masjid al-haram in makkah or the imam in masjid al we wear they wear the robe exact same mode that you guys were when you graduate university all of this is a legacy of the Muslim woman so why are you running away from all that Islam has done bearing in mind that they took it from us obviously brothers you guys did some good things as well mashallah 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 there's more sisters so I have to be fair and focus on them you don't mind, do you? Because you know you have to be real that inside this country, on the subcontinent, they have suffered. Would you agree with me? They've not been allowed to enter the masjids. They've not been allowed to have equal time studying under the scholars. And wallahi, they are the backbone of this ummah. The word ummah comes from the word um. Mother. And we neglect them. That's why I'm... Every time I get an opportunity to speak to the sisters, I try to focus on them a little bit more. But it's nothing to be shy of. I, Allahi, I hope that you, you, you share my sentiment when I say that I am proud that the university is a legacy of a Muslim woman and not a man. I'm proud of that. When you hear your daughter do something amazing or your sister do something amazing, this is who they are. They are our daughters, they are our sisters. So you guys don't mind, do you? Good, because I want to tell the sister something else. And it's a bit more special. You guys don't mind, right? Okay, good. Why don't you not smile at me? Why are you not looking at me like I'm upsetting you and hurting your feelings? You know, I have a sore throat and I came all the way to speak to you. <laughs> you at least smile and look a bit cheerful. Look, it's very important that you take heed, my, my sisters. It's very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah says and relate to them the story when the angel came to Maryam and said, Oh Maryam, Allah has chosen you, purified you and chosen you as the best of women from amongst the alameen. This is your role model. So I want to tell you something from the Qur'an so you can take away honor. That Allah gives you an empowerment from her story. Not from Beyonce. Not from Rihanna. Not from Condoleezza Rice. From Maryam alayha salam. Salamun alayha. Are you ready for me? There was a man called Imran. Not me. He had a wife. They were very old. They lived inside Banu, amongst the Banu Israel in Palestine. The area which is unfortunately today known as Israel. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist the Muslims all over the world, Amin. Do you guys know how messed up these people were that lived in that area? 
Look through the Quran, Allah is constantly saying, Oh Banu Israel, what are you doing? I gave you everything, I honored you as the greatest nation. And you know what they ended up doing? They murdered 70 prophets by one rock. There's a narration that says, by one rock they murdered 70 prophets. Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there a sin that you can think that's greater than that? Apart from shit? Killing prophets. They cut Yahya alayhi salam's neck off. They sawed Zakaria alayhi salam in half. They had internal problems clearly. They were messed up. Externally they were oppressed by the Romans. The Romans had taken over. These are people who are suffering. They're in a bad situation. Agreed. Imran alayhi salam and his wife salamun alayha righteous people. They looked at the situation that was around them and they wanted to do something different. They wanted to make change. They wanted to flip the script and change the scenario. They made dua, the wife of Imran, she makes dua, she says, Ya Allah, bless me with a son. Because this son, I'm going to put him in your path so he can make change and change history and fix things here. When you look at the tafsir, they explain, this is why she made the dua. So she makes this powerful dua. She's an old woman, she cannot have a baby. But then she becomes pregnant. Is this not a miracle? An old woman, she's a buddhi. Old woman, but she has become pregnant. Is that a miracle or not? Now, if you are in her situation, and you've just made three duas, that you become pregnant with a son, who will change the world. If the first one comes true, are you not going to think the second two are going to come true? That you're going to have a son who's going to change the world. But then she has a baby. She's giving birth. Can you imagine how excited she is? But she doesn't give birth to a boy. She gives birth to a girl. She's disappointed. She's disappointed. Because you can't change the world through a woman. You can't change the world through a woman. What the hell is a woman going to do? Stay at home, cook and clean. How the hell is a woman going to go and change the world? Like, Ya Allah, you, I didn't, I'm an old woman. I didn't want to suffer pregnancy just so I can have a girl put lipstick on her face, ponytails and pigtails. And walk around and show her off so everyone says, MashaAllah, kidney khubs for it. Hey Allah, we a son to change the world. Can't change the world through a girl. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's responses. Wallahu a'lamu bima wadu'atu. Walay sabdakaru kal unza. Allah says, Oh, wife of Imran. You think I don't know? What you have given birth to? You think I don't know that you just gave birth to a girl? The male and the female are not the same. Do you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to teach us? That if you want to change the world, you don't do it through us. If you want to change the world, we change the world through you guys. Through you guys. So every time you turn on the TV screen and you see blood on the streets and you see Muslims suffering, ask yourself, ask yourself, how long is it going to take you to return back to Allah, acquire true happiness? Because however long it takes for that to happen, is how long Muslim women and children are going to be getting buried alive, raped, murdered, massacred, and dying of hunger. My teacher, my ustad, he said to me, Wallahi, the situation of the ummah will not change until the queens of our ummah realize their role. And that's each and every single one of you. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's necessary for us that you 
are more special and have a greater relationship with Allah than us. Wallahi, it hurts me when a Muslim man leaves the religion. It hurts. But if a man leaves the religion, he's just one guy who left the religion. But if one of you leave the religion, if one of you take off hijab, if one of you stop praying, if one of you listen to music, if one of you become someone of fisk, of rebellion and sin, an entire nation just deviates with you. If you leave, an entire nation just leaves with you because you are a queen of your own nation. This is why the word Ummah comes from the word Umm. Mother. Do you see what I'm saying? And these are the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And this is the happiness you can find if you turn back to your king. Just put your head on the ground. Five times a day. That's all Allah asks. Nobody cares about your education. I'll be honest with you. When you compare your education with even one eye of the Quran, I spit in the face of all your degrees. And I, and I do not feel any, any shame in saying that. Because Allah started the Quran with Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read. Allah told you, study, educate yourself. But in the name of your master. Not in the name of a medical degree. You can get the medical degree and I will give you a kick up your backside until you go study. But wallahi, never ever put your studies before your salah. Never put your social activities before your namaz. Never put anything in this world before you and Allah. Because Allah, look, let me give you an analogy. If I make this microphone and I build this microphone with my bare hands and you come to the shop and you want to buy a microphone, you say that we have Sheikh Yusuf Chambers coming all the way from the UK, he speaks on Peace TV with Dr. Zakir Knight, and we need to make sure we have a very nice microphone for him to speak. And I tell you, I made this microphone. I know it inside out, and I'm telling you, this microphone is rubbish. I'm telling you, it's rubbish. It's faulty. Are you going to buy it? Why? Why? Pardon? Because I'm the maker, I know it better, right? So only a fool would come and buy the mic. Agreed? Now look what Allah says. Allah says that He created the heavens and the earth. This dunya that we live in, He subhanahu wa ta'ala made it with His hands. Listen, He made it with His hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that in His sight, this dunya is not even worth the wing of a fly. A wing of a fly. A fly goes and sits on toilet. A fly likes that environment. It sits on the garbage in the toilet. If it, go, if it sees a piece of poo, it will jump on the poo. That's what it likes. It has fun. But not even the entire fly. Just its wing. Allah said one wing. This dunya is not even worth that. Deep, really, your degree is part of this dunya. Unless you do it for the sake of Allah, it's not even worth the wing of a fly. So I don't care if you have an exam the next morning, but if you miss Fajr prayer on purpose, just so you can get a good grade, just so you can go out and have a good time with your friends, you just trade it in. Your akhirah, your life, your relationship with Allah for something that's not even worth a wing of a fly. What a stupid investment. That kind of person is an idiot. That kind of person should go to the mental asylum. That's not normal. That you give up the riches of the heavens and the earth that Allah has prepared for you for a wing of a fly. Let's leave on a positive note. We're talking about happiness in Allah. That's the theme. If you have a relationship with Allah, you have happiness. That's the theme. That's what we're talking about. You follow me? There is something that Allah has prepared for you that is going to make you so happy. It's going to make you so happy that Allah can't even give it to you in this world. Because you might die. And you know when you have so much fun and then you have a heart attack? 
You know, people they're clubbing and they're dancing so much that suddenly they die because they're having so much fun. This one thing that Allah has prepared for you is going to bring you so much happiness. It's going to be so fun that if Allah showed you even a fraction of it in this world, you would die. So Allah has prepared it for you in Jannah. Let me explain to you what it is. When you go inside Jannah, first you're going to have a conversation with Allah. Allah is going to ask you, and guys, please give me five minutes of your time and I'm done it, inshallah. I know it's been a long day, but this is the, this is the grand finale. This is, this, is, this is the body slam. It's the Mike Tyson haymaker. It's the shank that cuts through the jugular vein like in Kill Bill. Now, you didn't understand the joke? SubhanAllah. Laugh. Laugh. Okay, look. You're going to go inside Jannah, inshallah. You're going to have a con conversation with Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to say to you, He says, Ya Ibad, all my slaves. You made it. Takbi! You made it! Now, it's my turn to fulfill my promise to you. Allah will say, What do you want? Ask me. Ask me whatever you want, whatever your heart desires. And you say, Really, Allah, anything? Allah, can I get some Jimmy Choo shoes and some Gucci handbags? Can I get a Ferrari car that flies in the back of an angel? Right? Can I get 72 Hurlain? Inshallah, inshallah. I have to. Who said astaghfirullah? Who said astaghfirullah? If I start pulling out some ayat of Quran, wahurun kam thalil lulu il maknun, jazaam bi ma khair ya manun. Inshallah, fast. You want to know what you guys get? You really want to know what you guys get? Do you know that Yusuf alayhi salam, he had half of the world's beauty. Ahur Lain is beautiful, but half of the entire world's beauty in his face. So much so that when the women walked past, when he walked past the women, he was cut, they were cutting fruits and vegetables. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, They sliced right through their fingers and they didn't even feel the pain because they're like, Imagine their finger has fallen off, it's been cut right through. The exaggerated version of sliced right through, they cut it off. They're like, imagine that kind of beauty. Imagine that kind of handsomeness. That you cut your finger, you don't even realize. Every single man inside Jannah will look like that. And the Hurlain, by the way, they are your slaves. Just so you know, they are your slaves. When you Wanna go out and do something and you don't want to spend time with your husband, you say, Jao ski pass, what's good time to do? You say, when I come back from my Jannah party, and then you can spend time with a real queen. Because you are the queens of Jannah, as long as you guys know that, right? They're actually your slaves. Right? We're just sad guys, just okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, as long as you know what I'm saying, right? So you'll ask, you say, Allah, can I have all these things? And Allah will give you, He'll give you, He'll give you. And then Allah will say, but you forgot to ask about this. Allah will remind you of the things that you forgot. Maybe you were five years old and you wanted to be a superhero. You wanted to fly like Superman, but you forgot because you grew up and you became a robot that introduces himself like, Salaamu Alaikum, I'm MBBS. What a sad way to introduce yourself. Salaamu Alaikum, my name is Imran ibn Masood. This is what we do. We're saying, we're saying, we're saying, Jay, what up, Jay? That's how we speak in the UK. Personality, right? So you forgot that you wanted to fly like Superman. And then Allah will say, but you forgot that you wanted to be a Superman. You forgot you wanted to be a princess. Here, here's your princess palace and a pony that flies. Allah will remind you of these things. Subhan. And then you'll say, okay, Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah, I'm good. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to you, here are some things that I want to give you that you could not even have imagined. Things that you didn't even know existed. Have some of this as well. And this, and this, and this, and that Allah will keep giving you. And then, 
okay, I'm good, Allah. I've got a lot of stuff now. I've got like about a trillion years it's going to take me just to go through this stuff right here. Now listen, when you have all these things, are you not going to be happy? Is it not going to be a fa like fantastic feeling? You've asked Allah, listen, listen. You've asked Him for everything that you wanted. Everything that you forgot. Things that you didn't even know. Is there anything else that you could possibly want right now? All three angles have been taken care of, right? Okay, so now you're enjoying Jannah. You're enjoying Jannah. You're having your little Jannah party with the Jannah sisters. And your Jannah handbags. The Jannah Hurrain. Inshallah, Inshallah. Say Inshallah. Say Inshallah. Oh, that's, that's so nice of you. <laughs> Suddenly, you're going to hear a noise from above. Ya Ahlul Jannah, Ya Ahlul Jannah, O oh people of Jannah. Allah wants to meet you personally. Allah wants to meet me? Allah wants to meet me? You say, yeah, where? Every single person in Jannah, Ahlul Jannah meaning people of Jannah, will run to one mutual location between a valley. Whilst we're there, <coughs> we're going to be like, okay. So what do you think Allah wants to say to us? And we're going to have this conversation, we're going to have this discussion. And whilst we're having this discussion, suddenly we'll hear a voice from above again say, Ya Ahlul Jannah, Ya Ahlul Jannah, O oh people of Jannah. Today, Allah wants to reward you. See, Allah wants to reward us. Has He not already made our scales heavy? Saved us from the fire? And accepted us into Jannah? How else can Allah possibly make us happy? As we're having this discussion, we will see a light in the sky and we will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come to visit us. So we will be quiet. You don't speak in the presence of a king. You don't want to speak in me. You want to see what he has to say. So we will say, we will stay quiet and Allah will speak to us. Allah will speak to me and you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Ya Ahlul Jannah, O people of Jannah, this is the day where I'm going to give you more than I've given you previously. So ask me whatever you want. The only thing that we will have to ask at that time, the last thing that we will desire, remember we've been given everything, the only one thing we will want, we'll say, Ya Allah, we just ask that you're happy with us. Have we made you happy? And Allah will say, Ya Ahl al Jannah, if I was not happy with you, you wouldn't be here right now. I told you to ask, must ask me for something more. Not something I've already given you. I'm already happy with you. Ya Ahl al Jannah, Hada Yawm al Mazid, ask me more. Do you know what we're going to ask? For? We're going to say, Allah. Just show us your beautiful face. Just show us your beautiful face. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the covering from his face. 
Allah will show us his face. We are not worthy of seeing his face. Allah will show us his beautiful face. And then in that moment when we're enjoying his face, the face by which all darkness is expelled and everything becomes light. In that moment, Allah will remind you. And He will say, do you remember that boy that you used to speak to? Remember that sin that you used to do? Remember when you used to disrespect your parents? Remember when you used to message that girl on Facebook and watch those dirty videos online? Remember when you used to miss that namaz? Remember when you used to do chugli? Remember when you disrespected your teachers? Allah will remind you of all the sins that you used to do. And you will remember that time that you are not worthy of seeing His face. And He has given you everything. And the greatest honor, which is that you can see Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will say, Ya Allah, just forgive us. Please just forgive us. And Allah will say, Ya Ahl al Jannah, had I not forgiven you, I would not have entered you into my Jannah. I'm happy with you, so enjoy it. And that is true happiness. When you have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, The whole world can turn its back on you. It's okay. As long as you make tawbah. And tawbah means to turn back to Allah. The one thing that I will leave you with. I never say to you, break up with your boyfriend. Break up with your girlfriend. I'll never say to you, stop listening to music. I'll never say to you, stop backbiting. Because this will happen the moment you fall in love with Allah. And the way to fall in love with Allah is to learn about Allah, know Allah. Allah created you to obey Him and worship Him. You cannot obey Him if you don't love Him. You cannot love Him if you don't know Him. Today you learned a bit more about Allah. Do you not love Him a little bit more? I'm asking you. Do you not learn about Allah today? Did that not make you love Him more? Learn about Allah. You will love Him more. You will obey Him more. Today, do you not feel like stopping some sins? Do you not feel like doing better things? Obeying Allah more? The formula is, learn about Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Study, implement, apply, then teach. But the basic thing I will tell you to do, and if you don't do this, which is the salah, the namaz, understand that you will enter the hellfire. خالدين فيها فيها أبدا inside it for eternity never coming out that's the basic basic relationship with Allah He didn't create you to worship the people He created you for Himself you will go to the hellfire if the least that you cannot do is lower your head five times a day and say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim All oh, praise and thanks is to you Allah Thank you for everything that you have given me My eyes, my ears, my mom, my family My mind, the education, the grades Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim The most merciful why are you merciful? Because Allah, you gave me these things even though I didn't deserve any of them. That is why I will thank you. And Allah says in the Quran, thank me and I will give you more. So pray. That is the formula to increase to success. That is the formula to happiness. That is the formula to Jannah. Learn about your master subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad.